again. Look out, Mama, it's Danger Man cooking. Hello and welcome to Danger Man Cooking. My name is Steven Schlissel. And I'm Gary Schmidt. And I'm rolling in the dough. Today on <laughs> Danger Man Cooking, Gary will be taking us up the street to Earth Sky Time Community Farm. And we'll be making two vegetarian dishes with their products. Uh, and they will be involving a little twist on each of the dishes. Then we will be asking Barbara Camolo, our wine expert from Camolo Antiques and Wine, in Manchester to assist me in our final dish and then assist Stephen and I in drinking our glass of wine. Sounds like a plan. Okay, before we get started, we're going to go visit Oliver and Bonnie up at Earth Sky and Time Farm and see what they're doing with their veggies. Well, here we are at Earth Sky and Time. We're about uh, two miles south of Manchester Center on Route 7A. And with me is Oliver and Bonnie Levis, the owners and creators of this farm. And uh, Oliver, how about if you just give us an idea about the philosophy behind the program and what you're uh, accomplishing? Sure. Um, this is the farm that I grew up on. My parents moved here in the early 70s. Um, it wasn't so much actively farmed at that time. It was just a big old house. And uh, gradually, I realized this is what I wanted to do. Um, I moved away, uh, went to school, studied agriculture, did other things, came back here, gradually figured out we wanted to raise a family and uh, grow vegetables and make delicious food and have a lifestyle right. that we aspired. Um, so the philosophy was basically to um, pursue our lifestyle goals and then everything else sort of was uh, opportunities that came together that um, led us into one thing or another. I mean our, our farm is powered by interns who come uh -huh. here to learn about farming and uh, then we sort of got into baking gradually because there was a market for it and we like to eat good food right. so right. it was, was one more thing that we could do and now that is uh, one of the central things that we do here on the farm. So. The philosophy is good food, people working together in cooperation, and um, you know, good food, good living, sharing memorable right. Right. times. And so you have uh, many facets. Uh, obviously, uh, vegetables. Uh, you raise chickens, uh, and you bake bread. And so all of these items are available to the public through farmers markets. We do three farmers markets a week. That's uh, Manchester, Londonderry, and Dorset. We also have a CSA program, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture, where um, families in the area can buy in for the season and they get uh, a share of the harvest. So every week they come to the farm and pick it up, and they can also get the other things that we make here, along with the produce. And then also we have um, wholesale accounts we're selling to restaurants. Uh -huh. And then in addition to that, um, we're building a farm stand here, so in the near future, we'll be able to just come off the oh, street okay. and get produce. And yeah. of course, we also make veggie burgers, which um, are pretty widely distributed in the area. We're from uh, Montpelier down to Brattleboro and Bennington, and go over to Albany and, and then the Berkshires too. So we're in uh, co-ops yeah. all over the region with our, our veggie burgers, which are organic, uh, farm-based right. veggie burgers. And Bonnie, uh, so what's your basic role here besides doing everything? <laughs> well, I guess doing everything includes keeping Oliver focused, as we were joking about before. Um, I uh, help out in the kitchen uh, making some of our other prepared foods, like the hummus, the pesto. Um, as we've gotten sort of into bigger quantities, we've gotten uh, some more machinery in the kitchen, um, so f figuring out how to be efficient with the scale that we're doing things at. Um, also, we have three young kids, Tallulah, Eden, and Gov, and so I'm the mama of them, and also the house mama, sort of, of uh, just making sure things are running smoothly with our interns and making sure everyone's sort of happy and productive and things are balanced, we attempt to be balanced, all the work that gets done around here. And uh, um, what about the, the food production, uh, since you're doing 
larger quantities of hummus and, of course, bread? Uh, how do you regulate recipes uh, uh, and quality control for that sort of stuff? Uh, well, Oliver is uh, sort of made an Excel spreadsheet for a bunch of our recipes, um, the ones that need to really be standardized, and so that's that's uh, just follow, that's pretty much just following a recipe and then tasting it, making sure it's good and adjusting uh, as necessary. Some of the things that we make are, are based on what we have ready to harvest. So pesto always tastes a little different um, depending on what herbs we have um, in quantity. Um, sometimes it's all basil, sometimes it's basil, cilantro, pesto, sometimes there's parsley, bok choy, sort of whatever greens that we have um, in quantity just go in there. So that's just a question of, of uh, tasting it a lot. Um, but we have, we got a grant from the government last year to get a 48 quart robocoop. So it makes it a lot easier to do big batches of things um, and instead of doing little batches and tasting each batch and then mixing it together. So, right, right. Um, so things like that have got made our operation a lot easier. And uh, also for the veggie burger batter, that robocoop comes in really handy to make enormous batches. We make about a thousand burgers a, a week. Um, so having that machinery really made the process a lot more efficient. Oliver, I've seen the uh, bread oven that you have installed. So tell us something about that and the different varieties of bread that you create. Sure. So the oven that we have just built this spring and summer, it's um, uh, a wood-burning oven that comes from Spain. It's called a Yopis oven. And what's special about it is that the, the entire um, inside of the oven spins. So there's a small hearth door where you put the bread in and out, but you have a surface area inside which is about 11 and a half feet um, in diameter. And that whole thing rotates so it's totally even the bake, uh -huh. but because there's such a small door that it keeps its steam inside it really well. And um, that was the only oven that is wood-fired that could have that type of precision. Like with a normal wood-fired oven, it's called like a retained heat oven where you right. light a fire in it it burns uh, up all the wood and then you clean it out then you put your bread in there and close it up and it bakes w off of the heat that's left over in, right. in the masonry mm -hmm. from the fire but um, with that type of oven you just are baking until it cools down to a point where you can't bake anymore right. but with ours it has a, it's called an indirect firebox so you can keep the fire r going while you're baking and keep the oven at a steady temperature, whether you want a hot temperature or right. a cooler temperature, because we're baking things like the veggie burgers and granola and other things that bake at a cooler temperature, cracker bread. Um, so we wanted to be able to have that control. And also, you know, if you had a big oven that didn't spin, you'd be working with a peel to pick up sheet pans, you know, in right. the back corner and spilling granola and sliding veggie burgers would be a mess. So this was a, it was a big investment. So as the bread spins around, you have the one door, you have to then grab you, the bread as it Well, you use a peel. So we, our peel is about uh, probably 12 feet long. Uh -huh. So you're only working half of it. So you, you only have to reach any point about six feet into the oven, but then, you know, the other half of it is for balance. It's hanging out the right. back and you, you know, you work that and you, so whether you're, when we're doing bread, they go right onto the masonry surface inside the oven. But a lot of the things we do, like the veggie burgers and everything else, they're on metal sheet pans. Mm -hmm, right. So those are sliding in and out, right. and we're working with the peel. But one of the beautiful things about that is that um, because the oven, it's about 40,000 pounds, so it holds its heat incredibly well. Wow. And we're able to fire it for the bread, so it's to get pretty hot for making mm -hmm. bread. But then for the other things that bake at a cooler temperature, we can kind of just let it gradually cool down and bake at a significantly right. cooler temperature without using any resources at all yeah, to get that. Great. So we're, we're using the heat pretty efficiently, baking bread about every other day and then using it for something right. at a lower temperature on the alternate days. And the different varieties of bread that you bake are? Well, our uh, staple is the uh, Levan, which is a, a whole wheat French style mm -hmm, sourdough. Right. It's not as sour as the San Francisco mm -hmm. style sourdough. And then from that basic dough, we make other varieties as well. We make a multi-grain, which is about, uh, by weight, 50% grain to 50%. So 50% soaked grains, 50% flour. So it's a pretty dense and nutty uh, loaf. And then we also make a semolina, sesame semolina bread. That's uh -huh. sort of the rustic Italian traditional bread. It's really a right. yellow crumb from the semolina wheat. And then we also make an olive rosemary swirl where we use um, Greek 
Kalamata olives mm. and a lot of olive oil and rosemary and we then take the lavand dough and we roll it up and bake it in loaf pans so it gets a lot of uh, the crispiness from the, right. from the oil sizzling in there and then we also do a cinnamon raisin rolled up bread we also do a gluten free multi-grain bread and that's got about 25 ingredients in it basically <laughs> everything but wheat right. ciabatta we make a we make a stevie wonder bread which is our our uh, sliced <laughs> white sandwich bread but we put a lot of whole, a lot of bran in it to give it at least some right. redeeming quality but it's, it's been a, a popular one and, and so uh, making the bread uh, has this been a passion let's say for you previous to this or is this something that you have both kind of just adjusted to and I mean, I've, I've, been, I've played around with it for a while, um, always interested in the naturally leavened bread, always interested in soaking grains, and we were doing stuff with sprouted grains originally, uh -huh. and um, later on it just became a matter of like, we needed to make a certain number of things, people want to come to the farmer's markets and know what to expect that you're going to have, you know, there's these certain, oh, I like your semolina bread, if you right. decide this week that you're making something else, then right. People are annoyed, so you know it made me to focus down. We we make probably about nine or ten different kinds of bread, and we make the same ones every week. Yeah. So like right now, we have this big garlic crop that you might notice here in front of us, and um, so th with the garlic, the way the uh, the garlic grows is that there's a scape, which is the seed head of the the plant, and um, it, that we cut the scapes off about a couple weeks before the garlic is harvested. Right. So the scape here's one that didn't get scaped. So that's what the scape would look like if you didn't cut it off. But right. when you cut it off, it looks like a curly cue like that. And so we cut all those scapes. And so we have quite a lot of garlic scapes on hand. And so we said, well, we use them for pesto. Right. We also make a garlic scape rosemary bread, which is a really popular one. This is a seasonal favorite. So, um, you know, trying to use Great. the resources we yeah. have on hand sure. to make Great. delicious food. So the oven, as I was saying, it comes from Spain. It, uh, it's about 40,000 pounds. It's uh, 14 feet around on the outside. It's full of uh, diatomaceous earth is the insulation, uh -huh. about two feet of diatomaceous earth all the way around. And um, the guys who built it came from Spain. Uh -huh. So it came on a container ship. And then uh, they came to uh, put it all together. But these guys were hilarious, I have to say. They, they have cerveza for breakfast, and they don't <laughs> stop from there on. They just. Uh, but I mean, they, they, he said he's built, I don't know what he said, I think he said he's built 300 of these ovens oh, really? or something like that, yeah. And uh, he just travels around the world. In fact, the next oven he was going to build after here was in Kazakhstan. So <laughs> I just had this like joke of, you know, him Borat building the oven with him, you know, just like, because uh, it's, it's such a funny thing and these guys are, are drinking their beer and, you know, cutting things up right. with torches and just, just having uh, fun, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's so great. But it's really the best oven in the world, I think. I mean, Sounds not that like I've it. used every oven in the world, but this is, uh, it's an amazing treat yeah. for me to, I'm, I'm a rookie, you know, by, by most standards. So Bonnie, uh, this is an organic farm, I assume. And uh, are you uh, part of a certified program? We are. Um, we've, well, we've always been an organic farm, but last season we got certified by NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association. And um, that means that someone comes uh, by and checks out the farm and checks out the paperwork, which is more challenging. The paperwork is more challenging for us than growing vegetables. But uh, right. um, so yeah, and so we're certified again this season. And for people who want to sample your goods, uh, I understand you have a farm to table dinner at the Wilburton Inn. Right. Um, on Tuesdays, starting at seven, people can come, and we make an enormous vegetarian feast here at our uh, commercial kitchen, and we bring it over to the inn. And people can dine out on the terrace with a uh, beautiful view of the mountains. And um, it's an all-you-can-eat buffet and dessert for $20. And it's great for us because we basically we have a CSA pickup on Tuesdays from 12 to 1. And whatever vegetables are left over from that, we turn into this feast. So it's a great way for us to um, use our vegetables in a really delicious way that the public can come enjoy. Great. And that's every Tuesday through the summer? Every Tuesday through the summer. Um, so Oliver, uh, on the CSA vegetables, what kind of uh, variety are you offering to the general public? Sure. Well, we follow the season. It starts in the spring and it's mostly greens and a little bit of you know, radishes and sprouts and right. peas and things like that. And it gets into 
things like turnips and kohlrabi and the early cucumbers and summer squash and broccoli and then you start to get into the tomatoes and that's where we are right now and tomatoes and then you start to get peppers and we do uh, garlic and we do new potatoes mm -hmm. and onions and I say eggplant and things like that and then we get into winter squash get into Brussels sprouts, get into cabbage, get into, did I say winter squash already? I don't yeah. know. Whatever, this, you know, stuff you think about for the for winter. Right, broccoli and... Right, so the way it works too is we don't pack a box for people, uh, which is sort of like the old CSA model, was like you just get a box and full of right. kale and cabbage and stuff that nobody wanted. Um, or some people wanted, but most people didn't really want them. <laughs> um, so what we do is we set it, everything out on tables and bushel baskets yeah. and let people pick what they want. Oh, great. There's point values for stuff. You know, a pound of tomatoes is a point. Four pounds of uh, potatoes is a pound, point. Like, right. you know, it works like that. Half pound of greens, yeah. whatever it is. You have nine points to spend. You take nine things. And then we also have pick your own herbs and flowers, and those don't count for points. So yeah. people can just get that stuff when they're here. Oh, that's a great system. That's, that's really nice. It works most of the time. I mean, sometimes... Everyone wants the same thing, and you run out. Right. But then there's something else that people can take. Right. So as long as people are flexible, uh, it works really well. Right. And uh, what about the chickens? I saw as I was driving up, you have a nice group of chickens. Yeah, uh, we have a nice group of raccoons and foxes, too. So we have to <laughs> keep on our toes. But um, yeah, we do chickens for eggs. And they're fed on uh, food waste, which uh -huh. is generated by local restaurants. And we pick it up three times a week. Mm -hmm. So And they're on pasture. So they're not fed grain. Right. They're, um, just recycling the uh, right. nutrients that are uh, diverted from the landfill. So it, it works out really well, and their eggs are amazing. Bright orange, full of nutrition, full of flavor. You, you know, uh, there's some funny quote that someone said. It's like, people say, you are what you eat. And then people said, you are what you eat, eats. Right. right? <laughs> so like, <laughs> what the chickens are eating is what you're eating. Right. So our chickens are eating a wide array. We get the salad bar from the Sirloin Saloon. We get the bagels from the Bagel Works, <laughs> uh, when you don't get them. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, we get the uh, Equinox Hotel. They have like lobster night, uh, something like mm -hmm. that. So we get all of their lobster shells, which is right. an amazing thing. If you think about eggshells, yeah, right. that's like the same as lobster shells. So yeah. they're getting all the nutrients from, Good from that Good chickens there. Yeah, they're doing really well. And uh, are the eggs part of the uh, CSA also? They are. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good deal. Okay, welcome back. And as you can see from the film uh, that Bonnie and Oliver do a fantastic job up there. So they've graciously given us these vegetables to work with. And they also raise chickens there. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is a dish that stems from the well-known dish called eggs scotch or scotch eggs. And that's a dish with a hard-boiled egg and they take pork sausage and wrap it around the egg and then bake it. So I had this idea that today we would do the same type of dish except do a vegetarian version of it. And as one of the basic cooking operations is uh, to boil an egg. So I thought we'd just go over that briefly because I know a lot of people, believe it or not, have a hard time boiling an egg correctly. This is nothing creative. This is all technique, uh, a very basic technique, uh, and we'll get creative later. So what we have is the pot of water, and we put it on, and we do not bring it to a boil first. We put it in the pot, turn the stove on, and drop the eggs in gently. Eggs, as you all know, are very delicate. So. It's safer to drop the eggs in the pot with water in it already. Sometimes people will drop an egg in the pot, there's no water in it, and it will create a minute little crack. And then as you boil the eggs, you'll see the egg coming out of that minute little crack, and that's not what you want. So we have the eggs in the water, and it's going to boil. We're looking for a hard-boiled egg, so we're going to look for 7 to 10 minutes once it comes to a boil. That's that. So now, as those are cooking, we're going to make our vegetarian encasement that's going to go around the egg. And for this, I uh, thought 
the other night that we should use chickpeas. So what we're going to do is create a falafel-like product or a uh, very thick hummus. So the first thing we're going to do is with the cuisine art is place into that two cans of chickpeas. These are two small cans of chickpeas that you get at any grocery store. I have fresh garlic from the farm, diced. We're going to put that in there. I like garlic myself, so I'm just going to put a lot in there. I have diced onion. That's going to go in there. I have a little salt. And then I have made here a uh, spice mixture. Spice mixtures are common throughout the whole world in cuisine. Uh, you have India is most famous for their curry mixture. Uh, the south of the United States is famous for their blackened seasonings. Uh, France, they have a, what they call pate spice. Uh, Chinese have a spi five spice. Essentially what these are are combinations of spices uh, and for whatever purpose it is you're using this, what style of dish will, di will dictate the types of spice that you use. So I want this to have sort of a Middle Eastern flair to it. So in my spice mix, I've put a little cayenne pepper, cinnamon, paprika, cumin, and uh, white pepper. And so I've blended it up. And basically what I have is kind of a curry style spice. Okay, so I'm going to add this to the blend now. And I want to have a fairly decent flavor coming out of that. So I've added something like three tablespoons. I'm going to put into this mix also an egg. And we're going to now blend it and see what happens. I don't want this to be too thin, so I'm going to watch it carefully because I want it a little coarse. going to have to put down the sides a little bit. It's looking good though. Uh, the reason we want this to be coarse is so that it has a little texture after it cooks and that so it will hold its own when we wrap it around the egg. Yeah, okay, so what I'm going to do now is add a little bit of flour to this. Probably about, uh, I would say, half a cup. That might not be enough, but we'll check it out afterwards. Round and round, where she goes, where she stops. Only the chef knows. Okay, that's looking pretty good. Yes, that's looking very good. So, let me show you what we have here. Now the egg the reason we put the egg in is to help bind it. The egg is going to hold it together. So essentially what we're doing here is making something like a potato pancake, but with uh, chickpeas instead. Okay, so that looks good. So we have here now a very nice tight paste of chickpeas and we're going to just, that's good. So we're going to hold on to this now for a moment. Now the next step to this dish is uh, a sauce. 
So if you can imagine what uh, the outcome of this is going to be, we're going to have an egg wrapped in our falafel-like encasement. And then we're going to open that up. You'll see how beautiful that looks. And then we're going to have a little sauce that goes with this. For the sauce, we're going to uh, make a curry-style tomato sauce. So we're going to start with some oil. I have some nice olive oil. Garlic. Onions. Now, like when you are making a, a curry, my experience is that once you start the uh, basic ingredients, the garlic and um, onions, that you're going to add your seasoning to this, your curry powder, let's say, if you're going to use a commercial brand curry powder. So we're going to add this, and we want the uh, heat to diffuse the flavor, to bring them out with the onion and the garlic. And you can smell that quite readily. And now we're going to add to this uh, tomatoes. These are yellow, orange tomatoes. They're delicious. We're going to add those to the mixture. And I'm going to reduce this with a little bit of wine that we're going to be drinking later. And uh, my rule of thumb, as I know many, many others think the same way, it's best to use good wine when you're cooking, uh, and especially when you're drinking, but it's good to have that quality in your dish, okay? Never buy uh, cooking wine from a store. That'll make you sick, all right? We put a little wine in there. Oh, boy, that really, you can smell that. Can you smell that? Oh, that's good. <laughs> and I'm going to add a little touch of salt to this. And the idea behind this sauce is that we'll just let the tomatoes reduce, and uh, we don't have to bother thickening it. Um, it'll be just perfect after it reduces. And so now, we're watching our eggs at the same time. They have just come to a boil, and so we'll time them for about 7 to 10 minutes, and then we'll proceed with the uh, rest of the dish. Okay, so now we have our falafel mix ready to go. And then the eggs have come to a boil. I've drained the water. And now what I'm going to do is just give them a slight shake in the pan. And this will crack the shells a little bit. I'm going to then place them in cool water. So they cool down. By cracking the egg in the pan, it allows some of the water to seep into the membrane, under the membrane of the egg, which then will hopefully make it easier to peel. So now we're going to just flip this off, and you can see how easily that shell comes off. We're going to take the falafel and wrap that around the egg. Now, this is going to be a little messy, but that's OK. So you take a bunch of falafel in my hand, push the egg in to the falafel, come around the egg. By the way, this is a world premiere dish. This has never been done before. 
rinse my hand off. We have a little olive oil into the pan. The pan has been heated up. I'm going to place the egg on there. Let's do another one. A bunch of falafel. Push the egg in. and place it in the oil. And as we go along, we want to just turn that over and you can see that it's browning nicely. Now, another way you can do this is uh, just stick it in the oven and just let it bake. Or if you have a deep fat fryer, uh, which I really would not suggest, but you could do it that way. And uh, then it comes out something like maybe circus food. <laughs> but we're going to saute this and just keep turning. And we're going to brown all sides of it. And then after every side is brown nicely, we're going to take this and bake it in the oven. Okay? So we're going to place it in an oven that's going at 350 degrees. And here we go. And that should take probably 10 minutes at the most to cook. So 10 minutes is up, and we're going to take the egg out of the oven and see what happens. And this has... Uh, browned nicely. You can see that this has been cooked thoroughly. It's looking good. And now we're going to present it with the sauce. So here is our hard-boiled egg that's been cooked with a falafel. Going to take our knife and slice it right down the middle and hope for the best and voila and now you can see how the falafel has been cooked around the egg we have the nice hard boiled egg right in the middle and the sauce that we made from the fresh tomatoes garlic and onion with the curry mix we're going to serve with the egg. And we'll put a little sprig of green onion. And there we have our world premiere of, it's called Chicken Chicks. Chickpeas and chickens. Okay, the next dish we're going to make is a, a basic preparation of sautéed vegetables, utilizing these uh, wonderful ingredients that we have from the farm. Uh, but in addition to that, I'm going to make uh, what they call in classic cooking a voulevant shell. And uh, this is a very easy uh, technique to know how to use uh, for yourself. Um, and it's very versatile. So uh, watch carefully because this is something that you can uh, do at home for many different types of occasions. What I have here on the board is a rolled out piece of puff pastry dough. Puff pastry dough is a very delicate uh, dough uh, layered on top of a layer with butter and flour and rolled. It's a very quite a long uh, process to make. Uh, but you can go to the store in the frozen food pastry department and uh, the best one that I've seen is uh, uh, Pepperidge Farm. It comes in a box the shape like this. It comes in a bag just like this. You pull it out of the bag, let it thaw out, and then once it's thawed out you open it up 
and you have a very nice sheet of dough. Now, I have to re uh, warn you that puff pastry is very sensitive. So you can't really manipulate it too much. Otherwise, it'll do some weird things. So once you get it rolled out, uh, be very careful with it. So what we're going to do is make two styles of Voulevent shells, and then we're going to uh, incorporate our vegetables with that. So the first one we're going to do is a round shell. I have round cutters. If you don't have these, you can use the top of a glass, however you want to do it. So we're going to take uh, one cut, and we're going to cut the same size again. We're going to place this separate. Now we have egg wash. Egg wash is simply a scrambled egg. We're going to wipe the pastry. The egg wash is going to act in two ways. It will first glue these two pieces of dough together and then it will also create a nice sheen on the pastry. So before we put this top layer on, we're going to take a smaller cutter and we're going to just make a mark, a very kind of, or we're going to cut halfway through. We're going to score it. And then we're going to take the pastry and place it right on top. Place it gently on the board, and then we're going to give the top a quick brush of egg wash. And to make things a little more attractive for the final product, we're going to take uh, a little of our seasoning and sprinkle it on top. If you have some dried herbs, that will be fine, dill, thyme, anything you want. Okay, so we have our round version of Voulevance ready. Now we're going to make a, a rectangle version or square version. And like I said before, puff pastry is very sensitive. So when you're cutting puff pastry with a knife, do not do this. Drag the knife. As you can see, if you drag the knife, it stretches the dough. And when it stretches the dough, when it bakes, it's going to do some very weird things. It's going to become what my, one of my favorite words is cattywampus. It will not sit right. So when you cut puff pastry, take the knife and just cut. Don't drag the knife. So we're going to cut a nice rectangular shape, not quite even. And then we're going to cut this exactly in half. One half is going to be the bottom. The other half is going to be the top. The top, I'm going to score very, very gently as so I do not disturb the dough. And you'll see the reason for doing this after it is baked. And so we're going to do the same procedure as before egg wash the bottom place the top on very gently egg wash that and for the garnish on this let's we'll just put a few chives on there That'll look, that'll look nice. And the egg wash, uh, as I said earlier, will create a sheen on top of the pastry, but it will also cook the, and solidify the chives onto the pastry. Okay, so now we're going to take the pastries and put them in the oven. When you're cooking pastries made out of puff pastry, the most important thing is to get the temperature of the oven up very high. 
So you want to have it somewhere between 400 and 425 degrees. Because the way puff pastry is made, it reacts to a high temperature right away. So we want to have that initial puff, and then we're going to cook it, and you'll see as it cooks, it will become probably seven to eight times, ten times as high as the dough. And then when it gets to that point, then we turn the oven down and let the pastry dry out for about ten minutes, and then we'll take it out of the oven and uh, deal with it. So here we go. We're going to put the pastry into the oven, and that will cook for approximately 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll bring it out and get going. All right, our time is up for the puff pastry, and let's see what has happened. Ooh, okay, you can see how nicely they have puffed up. The oven has been turned down a little bit, so they have had time to dry out. And now, once they come out, you remember I was scoring the middle of that uh, rectangular. So we're going to take the knife and just roll the knife around the edges and take out our little piece of pastry. And that will be laid on top of the dish at the end. And the same thing has happened. This one has fallen into the middle because it was already cut through all the way. So we're going to pull this out. And this will be the little cap, the little hat that sits on top of the vegetables after we put that together. So now, as I said earlier, puff pastry is very versatile. You could take something like this and use it as we're doing today with vegetables. You could put a little clam chowder in here. You could put some strawberries and ice cream in here, pate, anything you want. Beef stew, it's an extremely versatile pastry. And uh, as you can see, it was very simple to use. So now, we're going to finish this dish with sauteing these vegetables that we have here. So we're going to start with our olive oil. Now, vegetables in general uh, are very simple to cook, and there are multiple ways to cook them. What we're going to do today is saute them, which will be somewhat a version of a stir fry, but uh, it will not go as fast as a stir fry. So I'm starting with garlic again and onions. And what I have here uh, is a mix of vegetables. I have red peppers, carrots, zucchini, and butternut squash. So I'm going to put in the vegetables that are going to take the longest to cook. I'm going to start with the butternut squash, and I'm going to start with the carrots. Normally, butternut squash is not really thought of uh, to be cooked sautéing, uh, but this is um, similar to what would happen if you roasted butternut squash in the oven. This is just a faster version, and uh, the outcome is pretty much the same. As a, so as opposed to boiling butternut squash, Roasting in a pan or in the oven uh, retains uh, the integrity of the flavor a little bit more. And the same with carrots. Now, when you're sauteing something in the pan, regardless if it's vegetables or beef or uh, chicken, whatever, make sure that you have plenty of room in the pan so that things are not smothered. Otherwise, the cooking uh, will not process will not be correct. So we're going to now shift these vegetables over to the other side. Now I'm going to take the zucchini, which cooks very fast. It uh, has a much higher content of water. And I'm going to throw in the red peppers. I'm going to 
saute them nicely. And now I'm going to add some of our spice. Going back to the original spice that we used in the first dish, I'm going to sprinkle a little bit on. My rule of thumb for when I'm cooking and using uh, spices and herbs, a lot of people have uh, problems with the quantities. What I normally do is just cover gently the top um, area of the pan, and that seems normally to be enough to give the dish enough flavor. Add a little salt. And one thing I have with me today is some vegetable stock. So I'm going to throw that in and let the vegetables at this point now are kind of almost uh, in a way being steamed. So the stock helps uh, maintain the moisture in the vegetables and also gives a little additional flavor. Now, last two items that we're going to add while we're cooking the vegetables um, are the tomatoes. We're going to go back to the yellow tomatoes again. That'll help give the sauce a little more body. And turn this up high. We want that to really get going. And then I'm going to add a little wine. We used this wine in the first dish. Uh, this is a Riesling, and uh, Riesling has a slight sweetness to it. Depends upon the area of where you get your Riesling, but uh, some Rieslings are a little drier, uh, a little more tart. But in general, uh, Riesling has a little more sweetness to it than, say, like a Chardonnay. So I'm going to add a little wine to this. And with that, we're going to ask Barbara Camolo of Camolo Antiques and Wine in Manchester to come join me and help me uh, plate up this dish and then uh, get her opinion on the sauce that we have coming forth with the vegetables. So, Barb. Hello. Hello. How, How are, are you? you? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Can I help you today? You sure can. Great. So, uh, I've just added the wine to the dish, and as you can see, we're reducing. We're reducing the, the okay. uh, veggies in the sauce. And what I'm going to do is uh, let you take the veggies and fill the Voulevant shells. Okay. And I'm going to keep the sauce in the pan and finish the sauce with a little butter and heavy cream. Sounds and delicious. We'll just, uh, Sounds lovely. So these now, I think, are what we would call al dente. Perfect. And uh, they smell pretty good. They certainly do. And I think it's going to go perfectly with the Riesling that I picked out. Yeah, that, that is especially good wine. It goes well with curries. And we also have these tomatoes that you can tomatoes. add. Tomatoes. Tomatoes <laughs> that you can add to the dish for a little garnish. Okay, sounds great. Okay, so have at it. You betcha. And while Barb is finishing that up, I'm going to finish the sauce. So what we want to do is uh, create a little more thickness, a little, give the sauce a little viscosity, a little something to grab onto the veggies when we put it on. So I'm going to add a little touch of butter. I'm going to melt that down. And I do need to taste this for a second just to make sure, just to make sure that it's perfect. What do you think? <laughs> and last but not least, I'm going to add a touch of heavy cream. Are we cooking these little tomatoes? Uh, yeah, we can throw them in there quickly okay. and then I'll uh, So they just sort of burst cook, a little bit? Yeah, they'll cook with the uh, There sauce. we go. And we're going to add a little cream. The Boy, cream that good. will help the sauce in terms of body. And now, 
I'm going to take a little smidgen of butter on my whisk. I'm going to dip it in the flour and create a uh, little roux that will, as you can see, uh, thickens the sauce up mm -hmm. pretty, pretty readily. Okay, so why don't you grab those tomatoes okay. and uh, from the pan Alrighty. and got it. place them. Let's mix the colors up so yeah. you don't get all red in one and mm -hmm. all yellow in another. They look beautiful. I can't wait to visit Earth Sky Time. Yeah, that's a, that's a great operation up there. And you should taste their bread, too. Ooh. It is delicious. They mm -hmm. make uh, many, many different kinds of bread. And so then let's just uh, add a few more, sure, more veggies things. on there. Top it up a little bit. We might as well, as long as we have it. You betcha. That looks good. Okay. And we need a little rag so I can clean up the plate for you. All right. And now we're going to add the sauce. And uh, you can Gorgeous. put the Little caps on. Little hats. Put on the little hats. Yeah. Do you want a little chive on there to, uh, for yeah. a little bit of prettiness mm -hmm. color? That would be good. Chop it up for you. Beautiful. Okay. Looks lovely. Sprinkle it on. Look at that. That looks good. This okay, looks now that we have the hats on the puff pastry, uh, we have some cheese that we're just going to shave and uh, place on top of the dish as a little extra touch, a little extra garnish. And uh, this cheese comes from Consider Bardwell Farms in Rupert, and uh, Stephen is going to talk about that. Stephen, are you here? Okay, I am here. I am back. I, I've been Good. smelling this welcome. delicious meal, and welcome, Barbara. Thank you. Uh, I just was at Consider Bardwell Farm who happened to be the, uh, our first shoot two years ago. Since then, the Rupert cheese, which is close to my heart, I live in Rupert, has won numerous additional awards, including the American Cheese Award for Best in Class. This is a cow's milk cheese. A lot of their cheeses there are goat's milk. And Don't they also have a uh, cafe out there now? They've got they a cafe visit. on the weekends. and Angelo uh, runs the place. They've done, I was there two, three days ago to pick this cheese up. They've expanded. They keep on winning awards. It's amazing what they're doing. It's a pleasure to eat their cheese. It kind of spoils you for anything you can get well, elsewhere. Well, let's have a toast to good cheese and good okay, food. Okay, so I'm going to... And Barbara, uh, you want to tell us about this wine? Yes, the uh, Riesling that we're trying is from Australia. Usually, Australian Rieslings are bone dry, like an Alsatian Riesling. But this yeah. particular Riesling has a little residual sugar, and so it sort of matches the curry. You want a little sugar to match spice, like a Gewurztraminer goes very well with spice. So this particular one I thought would go terrific with it a does. fantastic meal. And, and one thing is when you're cooking curries, if it is on the hot side, something like the sweet wine will just... Tone it down. down you either want to do the opposite, because what you want to pay attention to is the sauce, not so much the meat or protein, but the sauce. Right. That's the most important thing. So, so cheers. Cheers to the sauce. And here's the food. All right. And until next time, keep, keep on, on cooking. Mama, it's Danger Man cooking. Oh, now.